leaders tell stories. Um, okay, because you have to give out clear messages in uncertain times. And I'm going to explain to you today why I think that stories are the best way, the most effective way of sending out clear messages in any times. So, okay, leaders tell stories. What kind of stories do you need to tell as leaders? Maybe you've seen this kind of story on LinkedIn. My four-year-old froze at her first ballet performance. I've failed you, she cried after the show. No, I said, you've given me something. You've given me a sad kid story to post on LinkedIn where I can get lots of likes. And I probably made the story up anyway because I don't have a sad kid, but I'm going to use that sad kid for emotional manipulation. Okay, is that the kind of story that you need to tell as leaders? Well, almost certainly no. But the emotional manipulation, not the right word, emotional engineering, stories move people emotionally. And I'm going to give you today three types of story that can make your people feel brave, feel wise, feel strong. You can move them to feel that way with stories. Stories are moving, not just emotionally moving, but you need to move people to action. And the emotions really count. So I'm going to show you three story structures that will help you make people feel brave and wise and strong. And who doesn't want their people to feel brave and wise and strong? That's a rhetorical question. The answer is, we do. Okay. So, okay, how do you tell a moving story? There's some useless advice out there about storytelling. Probably one of the most useless pieces of advice you'll hear, and you've probably heard this at school, is stories have a beginning, middle, and an end. Well, a piece of string has a beginning, middle, and an end. That doesn't help you to tell a story. I'm going to show you, by the way, later why stories have a beginning, middle, and end. Here's another piece of kind of not very helpful advice. Um, don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. Now, we used to joke when I was a journalist, we used to sort of joke about, hey, it's a great story, and then you realize it wasn't quite so good, and you'd go, yeah, but we shouldn't let the facts get in the way of the good, and then we, then we stopped, and we, we, okay. But here's an example of what I think is an example of facts getting in the way of a good story. So last time I was in Tallinn, it was about 18 months ago, and um, I was walking around the city at night, and I saw this, and I'm a bit of a history nerd, so I thought, oh, that's interesting, and it's the Estonia and it's the first armored car that was ever put into service in, in Estonia. And there's, I scraped off the snow, and there is the story of the Estonia. Hang on a second. Yeah, the story of the Estonia, it says. But it's not a story, it's a list of facts. So it has a 45 horsepower engine, 7.5 meters long, 7.5 tons heavy, it has a 37 millimeter cannon, and it carried 200 shells. That's not a story. That's a list of facts. You won't remember them, unless you're the guy fitting the shells. Okay, in that case, okay. But you won't remember that. It certainly doesn't move you in any way at all. It's just a list of facts. This is the story of the Estonia. It's the story of eight young men who left home one morning to go to war, not knowing whether they were ever going to come home again. That's the story of the Estonia. The story is in the people. The story is in the emotion, that's the real story. So I'm going to twe tweak, adjust. The real message here is don't let too many facts get in the way of the real story. Now, I know you have to communicate to your teams. You have to communicate. You have to tell them stuff. And maybe you're thinking, come on, they're all grown-ups. They're all, they come, they're working. I'm not their, I'm their boss. I'm not their entertainer. We're not reading bedtime stories. Can't I just email them the facts? Yeah, just read the email. Okay, here's the thing. Everybody, now, close your eyes. Close your eyes, and can you remember what's the color of the floor? You've got your eyes open, you're cheating. What's the color of the ceiling? What's the color of the shirt I'm wearing? What's the color of the shirt the person next to you is wearing? Now, open your eyes and you check. You can't remember. There's a billion facts in this room. 
never mind in the world, you basically, there are too many facts out there. So when you email some facts to your people and say, read the document, yeah, so read the strategy document, we've emailed it to you, we made you listen to it, it's just too many facts. I'm sorry, I'm busy. I'm really busy with life. So I'm going to show you a little thing, a little thing that will, first of all, get attention for the important facts you've got to communicate. Fix our attention on the thing that matters. Okay, here's a little scenario. Imagine there's a table on the stage. Okay, and the table, there are two guys sitting opposite our sides of the table. And on the table, there are some objects. Flowers, camera, letters, photograph on the table. One of the guys reaches out to pick up the photograph. The other guy says, you touch that again, I'm going to kill you. Right, what do you want to know? What do you want to know now? Okay, what's going on? Who are these two guys? Who's the woman in the photograph? What do you mean touch it again? What happened last time he touched it? Okay? You really, your attention is now fixed where I want it to be, which is on the photograph. So a writer would call this an emotionalized detail. You take the detail and you add emotion. Why, does he, why is he threatening him? Your attention is now fixed where I want it to be because I've used emotion. Okay, um, some of you drove to Pano to get here, yes, from, from wherever. Uh, can you remember the journey? Can you like, you know, it's like you're driving down the road and suddenly you realize you've been driving for 10 minutes and you haven't seen a thing. Oh, oh I hope I didn't hit anything, All right? But no, you haven't seen a thing. If that happens, ah, ooh, right, you remember that moment of the journey really, really well. Yes, the bit where you went, oh my God, that's the bit you remember because emotion. If there's no emotion, you don't remember. You don't notice and you don't remember because emotion fixes things, fixes our attention and our memory on the thing that has emotion. So if you would like your messages to be ignored and forgotten, don't add emotion, just give them the facts. If you would like your messages to be noticed and remembered, it's a rhetorical question. The answer is yes, we would like our, okay. So you have to use emotion. Now, I know what you're thinking. We're Estonians. If there was a spectrum in the room, and okay, from Europeans, and over here, the Italians. Okay, ciao, bellas. Okay, the Italians are here. Emotional, yeah. Then the Irish, the French, the British, the Dutch, the Danish, the, De the, the Swedish, and now we come to the Estonians. Yes, yeah, so the spectrum of emotion. The Estonians are over here. In the car park, people from Finland. <laughs> but I get it. Look, I get it. I'm asking you to, to tap into emotion, and you're going, we don't really do that. In fact, if I said, come on, let's do a, let's do a Mexican wave, you'd all go. In fact, the whole room would go, no. Right across the room, we don't really do that. Okay, so an Estonian wave is... So I get it. I get I'm asking you to do something that's kind of, you know, not culturally Italian. The first time I came to Tallinn, I was working in a room full of people like you, and I was explaining the importance of emotion in story. And at the coffee break, this guy comes up to a huge guy. He says, Steve, I, I understand what you're saying about emotion, but I'm Estonian and I'm an engineer. We don't do emotions. I said, okay, tell me about the last time one of your machines broke. Oh, it was terrible. And then he told me a story about going to Norway in the dark in the winter, trying to fix a substation and, oh, straight away, story from the emotion. So here's the thing, story equals facts plus emotion. That is what sticks in our attention and our memory. So you're thinking also, look, I've got to give people strategy important stuff I've got to give them. So I'm going to ask you a question about your company strategy. And we're going to use the little app. Hopefully it's all working for everybody. Okay, so the question is, if you've got to get your phones ready and answer this, on a scale of one to five, how well do you know your company strategy? 
And one is, <laughs> no, I don't really know it. I haven't read it. Right? And five is, I wrote it. I know it really well. OK, so we, can we do a little, can we call up the, the results page on the, on the screen and see how? So the one to five, how well do you know your company strategy? OK, let's see. Can we cut to the, uh, the results page? Oh, there it is. OK, so we're starting to see some good results. OK. I see you can tell, where, you can tell which way it's going. A lot of people know their company strategy. Very good. OK. That's good. OK, those two people who said not at all, we'll get you. OK. Next question. How well do you think the people who work for you know your company strategy? Be honest. I know you made them read it. How well do the, your employees know your strategy? Be honest. Now, while you're doing the vote, and before we see the results come in, I just want to tell you this. The Harvard Business School, about 15 years ago, did a survey of lots and lots of 20,000 different companies. And they asked that question, how well do you know your company strategy? 90% of employees said they didn't know or didn't understand the strategy of their company. Let's see, can we see the results of the, of the poll? Ah, OK. OK. It's gone flip reverse. Only two of you yeah, are confident that your employees know your strategy. OK. That's interesting. Why? Why is that? Well, because it's boring. Right? Here's a little thing. Even good companies get this wrong, by the way. When you talk about strategy, it's boring, unless you can add some story. So here's an example. New York Times last week. Oh, can we put the, the, the slides back up? New York Times last week, an advert in the New York Times. So this is the New York Times, a storytelling organization, talking about themselves. And they say, OK, subscribe to the New York Times. Sharpen employee perspective and empower forward thinking. And that sounds really strategic. Here's a test for you as to whether you're boring people. Imagine you go back to the hotel room tonight, 7 o'clock, just before you go down for dinner. The phone rings. It's your mum. And she goes, hey, how are you, love? And you go, oh, I've had a fantastic day, mum. Brilliant day. And she goes, oh, what happened? You go, well. I sharpened some employee perspective. And after I'd done that, I empowered some forward thinking. And your mum's going, oh, that's nice. Your sister's getting married next month. And you go, <laughs> so listen, I'm not saying mums are stupid. Absolutely the opposite. What I'm saying is mums are far too wise to fall for that bullshit. Strategy is important, OK, because it's the abstract wisdom of your organization. So what's going on in, in life as leaders? You have lots of experiences. You've been doing this for 20 years, 30 years, some of you. Lots of experiences. And you abstract the wisdom out of those experiences. And that becomes your strategy. Fantastic. Only you can do it. But it's really hard for us to see what you mean. Because you were there and we weren't. So we, weren't, we don't have those experiences that you have. So when you have a strategy, and you know, it's important, it's like a roadmap. When you have a strategy, you need to tell stories for the rest of us who haven't got your experience. Here's an example. OK, you're a food company. You make cheese. You're very proud of the fact that one of your strategies, we promote the highest standards of animal welfare. OK? What does that look like? Tell me a story. Here's what it looks like. In our cow sheds, we have a machine that scratches cows. And they can walk up to it and have a good old scratch. And they love it. Look at that. That's what highest standards of animal welfare looks like in a story. And so when the Amsterdam Cheese Company say, we promote the highest standards, you go, oh, yeah, yeah. Remember that cow machine? Yeah. You're actually imagining being a cow. 
getting scratched. Okay, that's how stories work. So remember, I'm going to show you three types of story allow you to move people emotionally to braver and wiser and stronger. And those three techniques are in this, this, this box of cards. I'm giving that away at the end of today to one of you. And I'll show you at the end of the talk how you can win the cards. Um, OK. Before I go into the, those three stories, I just want to share a bit of theory, if you like, about story. And this is the idea. I'm going to share an abstract idea and then illustrate it with a story. The abstract idea is a thing called consilience. Yeah, you kindless, is that? Thank you. OK. Which basically means if you get lots of evidence from independent sources all telling you the same thing, it's probably true. So in this uncertain world, get information from lots of places all saying, look out for China invading Taiwan. OK. So here's a story. To, that's an abstract concept. Consilience. It's a weird abstract piece of wisdom. Here's the story. OK, imagine tonight, you're walking down this evening, you're walking down the seafront at Panu. Lovely, the sun's shining, the sun is setting, sea air, and whoa! You've slipped in something. It's gone squelch. And you go, oh, God, I think I've trodden in dog shit. You know, oh, God, trodden in dog shit. You can take your shoe off, you go, oh, shit. It smells like dog shit. Well, hang on a second, okay. It looks like dog shit, it smells like dog shit, it felt like dog shit, it sounded like dog shit. Here's what you don't do. I'm not really sure. <laughs> ah! You don't do that. Four of your five senses are telling you that's dog shit. You don't need the fifth one. Okay, that's a little story. And so if you need to now remember what consilience means, right? You'll remember dog poo. And you'll remember the emotion of disgust. Ugh. Therefore, you will remember what consilience means. So storytelling consilience is there are three different levels. There's lots of different levels. There are three different levels at which storytelling makes sense. I'm going to give you three. There are many. It makes sense on a sociological level, a psychological level, and even on an evolutionary level. Storytelling matters on these three levels. Therefore, it's probably true. It's probably true. OK, first level. OK, this is a, 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 a Linda problem, the problem of a woman called Linda. We all know a Linda. Linda is 31 years old. She's single, outspoken, and very bright. At university, she majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with discrimination and social justice. She also participated in anti-nuclear demos. That dates her. OK, so we all know Alinda. Imagine you were at university with her. You bump into her now. And you go, OK, which is most probable? What's Linda doing now? OK, A, Linda works in a call center, right? Or B, Linda works in a call center and is an active Feminist blogger. Okay, so hands up for option A. Linda works in a call center. One, two people. Four, five. Hands up for option B. Come on. Everybody else don't know. Okay. About 95% have gone for B. You're all wrong. Here's the problem with Linda. The minute I gave you a character, you switch into story mode, where you should be in data mode. Indras was in data mode. You should be in data mode, not story, because I'm asking you a probability question. It's a Venn diagram. Remember those at school? That circle represents all the women who work in call centers. The other circle represents all the women who are bloggers. A is that big. B is tiny. Yeah? B is always smaller than A. In fact, A includes B. So the right answer is always A. But that's not a good story. That's a boring story. You want Linda to be sticking it to the man. Yeah. You want Linda to be fighting still, because that's the Linda you knew. She doesn't exist. I've been in training rooms where we've ended up having an argument about Linda. I'm going, so, OK, time, she doesn't exist. I've made, you know, OK. 
So when given the choice between statistics or story, 95% of you went with a story. That's interesting. Okay, so that's the sociological level. Let's talk about the psychological level. Any, any fans here of FC Flora? Yay. Okay. They're the biggest team in, in Estonia, yeah? So you're the big guys. Okay. Imagine you get really good cup run in UEFA, you get Man United at home. Suddenly you're not the big guys. And this is probably going to be the scoreline. But what if the scoreline was this? Wow. Okay, suddenly that's a story. Yeah? Why? Well, because, I hope this translates, we would refer to FC Flora as the underdog. Ale, yeah, yeah, is that right? The underdog, yes? And if they win, they are giant killers. So these are terms that in, in journalism, we used them all the time. My God, this is such a good underdog story. And I'd be curious, I go, why is it a good underdog story? Because it's an underdog, underdog and they'll be giant. Well, that doesn't help. We knew instinctively it was a good story. We didn't know why. Here's why. Giant killer. We have all been to the land of giants. We've all been there. Do you remember when you were that little and the giants around you could pick you up and put you on their shoulders? How, who's got kids this age now? Yeah, they're in the wonder you pick them up and you put them on your shoulder and off you go. You're the giant. We've all been the little kid yeah, in a world of giants and the giants could pick us up. So the little two-year-old me is going, okay, <sighs> bedtime, Steve. I don't want to go to bed. Come on, it's bedtime. I don't want to go to bed. Come on, it's bedtime. No! No, this is so unfair. Boom. We were picked up and put down by giants when we were little, whether we liked it or not. Therefore, we've all been underdogs. So psychologically, yeah, we're on the side of the underdog because we've all been there. No matter how rich you are and successful you are now, there's still the two-year-old inside you. So psychologically, stories work. They work sociologically, they work psychologically, they work on an evolutionary level. Now, I want you to imagine, we're ready guys at the back, I want you to imagine that you hear this sound at some point in the conference, you hear this sound. So, what do you do if a fire alarm goes off? Well, here's what you don't do. You don't pick up your bag and your coat and make quietly towards the exit. That's not what you do. The first thing you do is you look at other people. What's everyone else doing? What's Steve doing? Because he looks like he's sort of in charge. Okay, he's not running, screaming. If I was running for the door, if everyone else is running for the door, screaming, you will. If everyone else is sitting there doing nothing, you will. Yeah? You look at other people. When we are not sure what to do, we look at other people. And stories, good stories, are about what do people do. So when we're not sure, we look at other people. Stories effectively share the wisdom of the crowd. And that's an evolutionary advantage. What are other people doing? That's how we, that's how we su survive, is by looking at what other people do, by telling stories of what do other people do. That's how we've survived this far. So listen, stories are working. Sociologically, psychologically, evolutionary, three different ways of telling stories are matter. Well, it's probably true. They probably do matter. So I'm going to tell you three simple, really simple story structures, ways of telling a story that can make people feel brave and make them feel wise and make them feel strong. So what are they? Well, here's one. This is a little story I'm going to show you. It takes 20 seconds. It's filmed with a dashboard camera in a car and it's a Greek tragedy. It's a full Greek tragedy in 20 seconds. So. Let's see. Oh. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so what's going on in that story? Greek tragedy. First stage, hubris, pride. I'm walking here. This is my road. Second stage, nemesis. Those who raise up the gods, strike them down. <clears throat> Third stage, interestingly, catharsis. We all laughed. Everyone laughs. No one goes, oh, the poor guy. Oh, I hope he's okay. No one. We laugh. Everyone laughs. Because look how the mighty have fallen. Ha, ha, boom. It's following a story arc. And that arc is the, the downfall story of look how the mighty have fallen. That's a shape. It's a story arc. We're going to, I'm going to show you basically story arc is, is the rise and fall, emotional rise and fall like a roller coaster. What's interesting is when I teach story arc, then people have little conversations. I start seeing around the room people are doing this. They're waving their fingers in the air while they're talking. I go, ooh, that's interesting. So you need your fingers to work. Okay, we'll check your fingers are working. Okay, at least check your fingers are working. So what we're going to do is check your fingers are working. Okay, everyone stand up. <clears throat> oh, on the balcony too, very good. Okay, so I want you to, you can see me on the, oh, can we, yeah, you can see me on the screen as well. Can you see me on the screen? Sure, okay, so I want you to do exactly what I do. Let's check your fingers are working. Put your hands out in front of you. Raise one hand above the other. Cross your arms over. Twist your hands around like that. Mesh your fingers together. Now, get your, let your fingers working. Tap, tap, yeah, tap, 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 very good. Okay, tap, tap, tap. And now do this. <laughs> oh. Marily, the fingers aren't working. Oh, sit down, sit down, you've all failed. If you're very good, if you work really hard, I might show you how to do that trick. But basically, yeah, your finger, the power of story is there in your fingers once, once, once you've got them to work. This is a story arc. Um, anyone know the Harry Potter? Okay, so this is a story arc. It's an analysis of the text by emotional keyword. And as you can see, it's either rising or falling. There is no flat line in story. Flat line means you're dead. It's rising and falling. The same guys who did this analysis went on to analyze about 3,000 texts on the Gutenberg project. Fantastic. They do my work for me because they, I don't understand this. This is data. Indra, you, you, you're the man. Um, but I don't get this. But what I do get is they said, look, there's five or six story arcs that account for the vast majority of stories we tell. Okay. So there's rags to riches, downfall we've just seen, one called Man in a Hole, which I'll show you in a minute. Pride and Fall, which is the Icarus story, Jurassic Park. Um, and then the story that there, there's no easy way. So what we're going to do is we're just going to focus on these three. Because I've only got 15 minutes. So that's three stories. And these three stories are emotional engineering devices. These arcs will make the person listening to the story feel brave. Make them feel wise, make them feel strong, because you're going to engineer the story to do that to them. I say engineering, not manipulation, see? Engineering. Okay, so you're going to make them feel brave, you're going to make them feel wise, you're going to make them feel strong. Let's do rags to riches first. So rags to riches is a good success story. We started out small, we ended up, yay! So it's Cinderella, rags to riches. Every culture, by the way, has a Cinderella story. Every single one. It's Rocky. Yeah? It's tech billionaire becomes billionaire. You know, starts in the garage, becomes a billionaire. Yeah, we love that. We love this story. Okay, here's the interesting thing about rags to riches. It's actually not about money. So this is a rags to riches, looks like a rags to riches story, yes. The figures on the graph are GDP per head in Estonia from 1988 to now. GDP per head. That's interesting. Good look. We've gone from a bad place to a good place. 
But I've just told you it's not about money. Nobody actually cares about GDP per head, unless you work for the World Bank. Anybody from the World Bank? No. Okay. Nobody really cares about GDP per head. I'm just saying this is interesting that, that it matches. So what's going on in a rags to riches story if it's not about money, it's about this. Hidden virtue and deserved recognition. So at the beginning of the Cinderella story, Cinderella is down, neglected, but she's a good child. She's a loving woman. And by the end of it, everyone can see she's a good person. That's what matters in the, in the rags to riches story, not, not the palace, not the shoes. It's, the, it's the, the, the people can see she's good. So anyone can go a rags to riches story regardless of money. Let me give you a specific example. In 1988, in Estonia, you were in a very different world. And Estonia, as you know, began a singing, singing revolution. So you faced men with tanks and guns, and you sang songs. Because why? Well, because you are an independent people with an independent spirit. Your hidden virtue was your independence. And now the world can see it. Yes? You've gone from this hidden virtue through a struggle to the deserved recognition. Everyone can see what you're really like. That's your rags to riches story. It's a rags to riches story. And the moral of the story, if you like, how do you, what are you, why are you using this? Because you're trying to make people feel brave. You're trying to say, look, we've done this before. We can do it again. Brave. So we've done this before. We can do this again. And you're thinking, well, okay, some of us in the room remember 1988. And some of us don't. We weren't even born then. So how, if I wasn't even born in 1988, can I say to people, we've done this before? Well, I wasn't there. Well, maybe I was in school. Okay, here's what you do instead. People like us have done this before. We can do it again. And the people like us can embrace a whole lot of people. It, we're very empathetic. People like us have done this before. We can do this now. So that's... Bravery, the story that makes you brave. And in the, in the storyteller tactics, there's a card, one just one card, called Rags to Riches, shows you how to tell that story. Okay, here's a little test. See if you can answer this question. I'm going to give you a story, and I want you to see if you can finish the story with just three words. The founder of Match.com lost his girlfriend to a man she met. Okay, here we go. No, not in the gym. A, in a bar. B, on a bus. C, on match.com. So, hands up for A. Okay. Hands up for B. Hands up for C. Okay. Of course, the answer is C. Right? Otherwise, I wouldn't be telling you. If she'd met a guy on a bus, that's not a story. Unless the bus was being driven. No, it's not a story. It's not a story. Match.com is a story because, guess what? It's the downfall story all over again. Look, this clever guy. Ha ha. Ha ha. We love this story, by the way. We love this as much as we love rags to riches because we love seeing supposedly clever people come crashing down. So, okay, you might not want to tell this story. Right, you can tell it about your rivals, yes? But you don't want people telling this story about you. So what you do is you turn it into this story. Yes, we came crashing down, but we picked ourselves up. So this story is called Man in a Hole, because you can imagine a guy walking along. Yeah, we're walking along, minding our own business. Bam! Something knocks us down. We weren't looking. We were, we were on our phones while we were walking, and we walked off. Yep. Yeah. Wham! You're in a hole. You fell. Here's the thing. Anyone can fall into a hole. No one can fall out of a hole. 
you have to pick yourself up and climb. So in the process, you learn something. You become a little bit stronger and wiser because you won't fall in that hole again. So the beats of this story that you can use go like this. You start off in your comfort zone. Let's face it, most of us spend most of our time in our comfort zone. Something happens, bam. So I was running a training business three years ago that relied entirely on face-to-face -face training work and conferences and consult, okay, all face-to-face. -face. And I was happy. Then came the pandemic and I had no work. In the space of one week, I lost all my work, zero. And about a month later, I was online. I'd learned how to do online training. And by the end of that year, I was making more money than the year before. Okay, about 20% more. So, and now I can do both. So even though the pandemic is over, I now do both. So I'm in a better place as a result of falling in the hole than I didn't go back to my comfort zone. I went forward into a better place. So here's the thing, this model of story, you can get it, make it go dark. Yeah, falling in the hole is, is bad. It's a dark place. In the dark, you have to lose something old that no longer works. The stupidity that made you fall in the hole, get rid of that. And you learn something new, how to do hybrid working. Okay, we've all learned something new. And that's what lets you climb out to a better place. But it allows you to give a real roller coaster in the story. Also, by the way, this answers the question, Stories have a beginning, middle, and end, so does a piece of string. Well, okay, beginning, comfort zone, middle, crisis, end, better place. Right? You can do that story in three slides of a PowerPoint. Beginning, middle, end. Once upon a time, whoa, finally, happy ever after. Okay, that's useful to know. So again, in the story deck, stories that make you wise, man in a hole story, one card, one story endless uses, every mistake you've ever made, every lesson you've ever learned. Why are you writing your strategy the way you are? Well, it's because we've learned this. Now, here's the honest truth. Emotionally, it's very hard to talk about mistakes. Nobody really likes to talk about mistakes. It's quite emotionally difficult. Okay, let's just flip back a second to our football match between Tallinn and Manchester United. Have we got any Manchester United fans in the room? Oh, yeah, there's always one, two, there's two. Okay, here's a little question. It's a rhetorical question. Here's a question. You've got a couple of mates. They both say they're United fans, yeah? One of them likes United on Instagram. The other one has a tattoo on his arm. Who's the biggest fan? The guy with the tattoo, yeah. Why? Well. Liking something on social media is a cheap signal, costs you nothing. Getting a tattoo is expensive, it's a costly signal. Bloody hell, it's painful, it's permanent. So here's the thing about signals. Cheap signals are easy to make, therefore they're hard to trust. Costly signals are hard to make, therefore they are easy to trust. Here's the thing for you as leaders. How many times are you sending out cheap signals? Do you ever send out e like an email to all your staff is a cheap signal. A face-to-face -face meeting is a costly signal. So when you've got something important to say, technology is making communication cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Therefore, it's becoming less and less and less trustable because it's, not, it's a cheap signal. Costly signals, and here's the most costly signal you can make, is to talk about something you got wrong, because it's emotionally costing you. So, okay, it's hard, to take about, it's hard to talk about mistakes, therefore, everyone listens when you do. Okay, very quickly, I'm gonna show you one last story about mistakes. This is an Estonian company who make, uh, they service electrical motors. And the guy who runs the company said, well, we do a money-back guarantee. If it goes wrong in 12 months, we replace it for, repair it for free. And I said, okay, it's good. And he said, a thousand jobs, one came back on guarantee. OK, 
Okay, so you've got a thousand happy customers, one unhappy customer. Now, if you're the accountant, you're going, okay, that's good. I can live with that. If you're the engineer, you're going, oh, it's okay. The tolerance is okay. I'm the storyteller, so I said, tell me about the one. Okay, so what happened with the one is, the engine brakes, the motor brakes, the guys send it to the factory to be, to be serviced, they service it, they send it back to the client, and six weeks later, the client's like, your bloody motor has burned out again. What are you gonna do about it? I'm really cross. So they send the engineer to the client's factory, and yeah, sure enough, the motor has burned out. So he fixes it, and then he notices that the kind of the drive shaft from the motor is connected to a machine. You can tell I'm not an engineer. It's connected to a machine, and the drive shaft is loose. And that's what's causing the motor to burn out. So it's not our fault. It's your fault, client. So the engineer fixes it anyway. He fixes the thing that's not his fault. He fixes it and says, I've, I've fixed the motor, and I've fixed your real problem. And the client is like, oh my god, that's so good. That's fantastic. He's now their number one fan. So that's what, how powerful stories are, which are the, about the real roller coaster of life. And the real roller coaster of life says, there's no easy way to do a good thing. Because, okay, you start off in a bad place with a problem, the client's got a broken motor, you fix it, no, no, you didn't really fix it. The client's really angry, so you recover and you end up in a better place. That's the roller coaster story of life. And the, the moral of this story is we can recover. Yeah? We can be strong. We will make mistakes. We are the kind of people. I worked with a great tech company in, in Estonia, and one of the engineers said to me after this, he said, What I like about working here is we fix our shit. Yeah, we know stuff sometimes goes wrong. We don't walk away from it. Fantastic, we're strong. Again, there's a story card, helps you be strong. So I've told you there are three stories. There's a story that will make you feel strong. There's a story that will make your people feel wise. And there's a story that will make them feel brave. We can do this. So, Panu, we're going to do a, not an Estonian wave. We're going to do a Mexican wave. We're going to start over here with SD Energia, because we can do this. We're feeling brave. We're going to do a three, two, one. Three, two, one. Let's go, Mexican wave. Come on. That was a good Mexican wave. That wasn't an Estonian wave. OK, listen, I'm giving away. You can have one of these. If you connect with me on LinkedIn, by the end of today, I'll count up all the people who've connected. We'll pick one out at random, genuinely, and tomorrow we'll give them a box of tactics. And you can tell those stories to your people because they need to hear them. Thank you very much. No, no, don't go yet. Steve, come here. Thank you. We don't have any time for now, Q&A. No. Okay. But you stay with us today and tomorrow, yes? And That's people correct. can register to, to talk with you yep. in, in a more private way. Yes. Okay, in, in reception desk. Yeah, there's okay. some, yes. So, so I've got some slots just for one-to-one -one yeah. chats. Yeah, yep. so please ask from Steve. Okay, then.